There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir, they have the car stopped in 10 and branch microfiber. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. everyone and welcome to police off the cuff real crime stories i'm your host retired nypd sergeant bill cannon a 27 year veteran of the nypd and covering the murders of the four idaho students ethan chapin uh zayner canodal uh madison mogan and kaylee gonsalves there's been a lot of ups and downs in this case in in regards to the reporting of it because ever since the gag order, there hasn't been a lot of new information coming out, except that all changed this week. And in regards to the secret grand jury proceedings, which is, it's no, like when we use the word secret, grand jury proceedings are always secret. So it's not in just in this case that people think, oh, Brian Koberger, I've, I've had people in the chat say, Oh, his rights are being violated. They are not being violated. This is very usual. Grand juries are secretive proceedings. And it is a strategic move by the cr- prosecutor, Bill Thompson. Now, the defense was making all kinds of moves, interviewing witnesses, pre-hearings, which was supposed to start on June 26th. So we don't know specifically when the grand jury presentation began. It could have began a month ago, as far as we know. We don't know. It was secret. What we do know is they returned a true bill and they returned an indictment of Brian Koberger for four counts of first-degree murder and one count of burglary in the first degree. Now, folks, we always tell you that we present these cases from a police perspective. That doesn't mean we disregard the rights of the defendant, that we understand, and this is the greatest criminal procedure law, the greatest court system in the world, and he is innocent and to proven guilty. And I'll say that till I'm blue in the face, but apparently I don't say it enough. But saying it, also saying it and looking at him as the person arrested for having committed the murders of four young students, two 20-year-olds, and two 21-year-olds. And we look at the evidence, and we look at all of the factors in the case. And yes, we're, we think that the prosecution has much more evidence than we even know about. A- a- and as it starts coming in in dribs and drabs, we say, whoa. <laughs> yeah, exactly that, whoa. And we'll go over what in, in last night in the... Um, Deadline NBC, what they revealed, which we didn't know, but I'll also bring up the facts that we said early on in this investigation, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but we said they will do a financial on Brian Koberger and they'll find out everything he's bought on his credit card and his debit card in the months preceding this murder and even afterwards and potentially With that information, there could be some really, you know, we hate hate to use the term smoking gun evidence, but there could be. And we're going to apprise you of what occurred. The other thing is, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, discovery, it's not fair, and this, that, and the other thing. I looked at the Idaho law, and I just want to read you one paragraph of it. The exact timeline for when the prosecution must turn over discovery material can depend on various factors, such as the specific circumstances of the case, local court rules, and any agreements made between the parties or ordered by the court. It is advisable to consult the relevant Idaho statutes or consult with a criminal defense attorney for precise information regarding discovery timelines in Idaho. So what that clearly means is, guess what? There is no specific timeline. And... If it said they must have all discovery in by then yes, they would. Bill Thompson 
would be in violation of the rules. However, the law is not that specific. It doesn't say you have to have discovery in by this date and this time, and you must hand over this. Even questions that they don't even have to submit a lot of electronic evidence because it would be infeasible and would cost so much money that they don't have to do it. So I just wanted to lay that out there for a lot of people that are saying, oh, his rights, are, they're not being violated. Bill Thompson is following the letter of the law. Believe me, they don't want to go through all the trouble and all the effort uh, of doing a, a great job on this case and to hopefully get a conviction if, of course, Brian Koberger is the right guy and the evidence is starting to indicate that it looks like they have the right guy. And I, I apologize if some of you uh, think that he's innocent. That's your prerogative. But I think there's enough evidence right now that shows they got the right guy. And I'm just going to say that. With me tonight, and I, he's a professor of criminal justice at Albertus Magnus College in Connecticut. He's a retired NYPD sergeant. And he just happened to pick up a law degree along the way. We got Professor Mike Geary. Mike, welcome to the show. Billy, thank you for having me. You know, Mike, I was going to like put you on and make you talk about discovery, but it's right in the law there. Right. And that's one of the things that a lot of people that watch true crime and real crime and they watch us and they say, oh, they're just cops. You know something? You can read the law too. Go right. into the Idaho law books and it'll tell you discovery does not have to be submitted at a specific time. It has to all be submitted before the start of the trial. That's the specific time and date they gave. Mike, your thoughts? Yeah, that's it. Um, you could look up uh, on your phone. Anytime you think you are looking for any sort of law, you know, Idaho law, New York law, and in comparison, I was doing a comparison of Idaho and New York law just uh, earlier this afternoon. It's out there. It's published. There's no secrets whatsoever. And um, in New York, the only thing I could tell you about discovery is that it's customary, customary, not all, not required, but it's customary that um, the prosecutor turn over discovery material, uh, usually um, 30 days out from the date of the trial. But that's not a hard and fast rule because there are times when other evidence will come in and the prosecutor themselves may not actually get the evidence up until like the moment the trial begins. So long as the prosecutor turns it over to the defense attorney in, in a reasonable manner, in a reasonable time, it's all fine. So Mr. Koberger's rights have not been violated. Nobody's looking to violate his rights. Nobody's looking to do anything underhanded. The law is very clear. It gives a lot of leeway to all parties involved in the case. Very well said, Mike. One of the things on Dateline NBC last night, and I thank Pauline Buckles, uh, one of our subscribers, our fans, for apprising me of that because I didn't happen to watch it last night. A smoking gun, actually, I think a, a, such an important piece of evidence was that, and I don't know exactly how Dateline NBC found this out. Maybe they just called up Amazon and uh, knew an investigator or they had a leak from inside. Guess what Brian Koberger bought from Amazon before the murders. Are you aware, Mike, what he bought? Uh, well, I found out just recently. <laughs> he, he this is what he bought knife. on the purchased screen. A knife. He bought a United States Marine Corps K-Bar knife on right. his, uh, from Amazon. When I heard that, I was like, whoa. Now, what kind of argument will that the touch DNA is on the buckle of that sheath? Will that have any... Um, meaning at all when it's it shows that he bought a k-bar knife from amazon prior to this murder i mean it takes a lot of sting out of whatever the the um defense attorney wants to say oh the how do we know that knife could you know but he just he bought it he bought it from amazon right. strong right. evidence right um not only did he leave behind the the the, the killer leave behind the sheath to a Marine Corps K-bar knife. And we know it's a Marine Corps type K-bar knife because it had, I think, the stamp of like the Eagle Globe and Anchor on it. So boom, you've got that. You've got now the idea that he purchased it. And if you could prove that with a business record, like a receipt or something like that, in fact, it might be possible to go back and see 
if there is still a videotape or some sort of um, record, uh, electronic record, not only of a receipt, but maybe a video or a camera that at the time that he actually purchased it. And so that's fantastic. And then third, on top of that, remember what the uh, coroner said. They were speculating about the type of instrument that was used to kill um, those four young people. And it, they speculated that was a K-bar type of knife. So um, this is what you would call, you know, as close as you could get to a slam dunk type of situation in a, in a homicide case. You know, Mike, still, as much as we say it's powerful evidence, it's mm -hmm. still, we'll use that word, circumstantial. circumstantial right. It's still circumstantial evidence. And the other thing I was thinking, and it's probably not the case. Oh, by the way, Mike, if you ordered from Amazon, there would be a computer record right. that he ordered. It would be delivered to his house mm -hmm. so, right. or, or wherever he had it right. delivered to. So there's another digital record that right. he ordered it. And then, of course, Amazon sends you emails. Mm -hmm. Oh, Update. your package has left. You know, it's right. on its way. Your package is right. going to be delivered. So all of that is huge. And the only thing I thought that would be amazing, and if you look at this, what if there was a serial number on the sheath? I don't think there is. Right. But if yeah. on the other side, if there was a serial number on that, even, you know, of 0001 and starting in the first year, all the K-Bar knives they sold. Right. Mm -hmm. I doubt there is, but that would be even more yeah. powerful. It's already powerful evidence. Oh, yeah. The it, other, the, yeah. Well, go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. I'm saying at this point, it is so powerful standing right alone, right as it is right now. Look, we don't know how uh, Dateline NBC got this information. That, that That's not really important. Could there be leaks? Could someone in the case? Yeah, well, other stations are getting leaks. Why not Dateline NBC, you know? But there's other ways. They have their own investigators. They could have sent their own investigators to the Amazon investigators and said, hey, what do you got on that case? And, you know, since most investigators are prior law enforcement, they might tell another mm -hmm. prior law enforcement of the information they had. That's powerful, right. powerful information. Another thing that they, well, it wasn't smoking gun stuff from last night's Dateline NBC was that in his house in Pennsylvania, he had two identi identities, you know, physical identities. They didn't say, say whose they were, but they were found inside his parents' Pennsylvania house. That we knew already because the return on the warrant indicated. Mm -hmm. But the, the warrant, if you notice, was written very uh, sloppily, almost on purpose. That yeah. you would know that you know, uh, two. I it was like, what? What's that? What's item? You know, forty two. It, it, it was sloppy, but powerful. What do you think? Oh, absolutely, it's powerful. Um, it, strangely, I mean, for, when you think about the NYPD, and we always like to some tease about the NYPD. Uh, they were great record keepers, and when you we were doing invoices, you if I was typing up that invoice for all the items vouchered, I would put in there. You know, Pennsylvania identification number, such, such, such of this, uh, you know, um, Idaho student, you know, ID and the name. They deliberately, I think you're right. I think they deliberately left it really vague, almost like it, they were in a hurry to get it done. Um, I'm surprised at that uh, because when I first read it, I was like, I wonder why they would take somebody's ID. If it is one of the four victims, then, you know, that's another that's another slam dunk. Uh the only thing that could possibly be is if the the ID was from other people that he may have been thinking about targeting. That's the only thing I could think of that would be kind of weird, like a little twist. But um, if it is one of the f uh, four victims, you know, Ethan Chapin and Canodal and Gonsalves, you know, and Mogan, if it was one of those four, I mean, how do you talk your way out of that one? You yeah. know, Mike, we're gonna we're gonna connect the dots with also behavioral analysis, his body language when he was stopped. Yeah. We're gonna talk about some of those things later, but first, I want to put a little bit of Keith Morrison uh, on the screen right now. This is, of course, the Dateline NBC. Mm -hmm. oh, he has that really spooky voice. Yes, he's great. Meeting authorities anywhere on some of the questions involved in in um, in this particular case. 
That information unveiling more about Koberger's car ride across the country heading home for Christmas. We have found what really did happen. Uh, and, and that's an interesting story in itself. The origins of the K-Bar knife believed to have been used in the killings. So how much planning may have been involved, we can't say for sure, but there are some interesting indicators. And the story of a student in one of Koberger's TA classes, the alleged killer installing cameras in her apartment after a break-in. He's now a suspect both in the initial break-in and for reasons. To... That is brand new. That mm -hmm. is very, very spooky. Because here you have this, who later became a mass murderer, mm -hmm. uh, planting a camera inside one of his students' apartments that is scary and this is the first time we're learning of this your thoughts mike that is to me as a as a retired police officer that is uh smacks of stalking behavior that he was gonna he was gonna stalk that person wanted to know with the camera when they let when they showed up in the morning you know in the evening when they left in the morning their schedule i want to know what room that camera was in was it in the bathroom was it in the bedroom was it in the living room that is very sick uh, type of stalking, predatory behavior. And I think as an armchair, you know, criminologist, that it all fits together, that he stalks people uh, with the, uh, with, with the uh, murders in um, Idaho at the house. There's evidence that electronic evidence that he went by numerous times on numerous, on numerous occasions before. And then right afterwards, he did it also. Uh, you know, like eight hours later, it all seems to fit a, a type a type of predatory type of behavior towards uh, women. One hundred percent. Putting a camera in her apartment to which he would have had access. Experts diving into behavior that lies behind this type of criminal activity. When you trace his early life, it matches certain kinds of behaviors. Um, talking about seeing visual snow, for example, about the kind of Dissociative episodes he would have gone through as a young person, um, and and the the resulting need to kind of level the playing field in a very visceral and intimate way with people who had rejected him in the past, or or some representative of people who had rejected him in the past, um, especially young women uh, with whom he had always been awkward and had some difficulty relating. The special is Dateline's second show on the Moscow murders. Keith Morrison telling us about the tremendous interest in this case. Well, it's an absolutely fascinating story. The character study involved here um, is disturbing, but but I think it's probably important to know and to think about. Uh, it certainly wouldn't be the only kind of character like that, but it rather is like others who have uh, made their way through the history of this country. And people will find it fascinating. When Dateline began reporting on this story, everyone... You know, the fascinating thing really about this is when you do look back and they talk about what I call recon. Mm -hmm. He was, he reconned this location 12 times. Now, there's people that listen to real crime and yeah, he was delivering pizzas. You believe whatever you want to believe, <laughs> all right? Yeah. You know... He was delivering food. That No, no. He was reconning a location that he was intending to do bad things at. You know, 12 times he reconned that. All right. He was very sharp in certain things, turning his phone on and off, you know, about being clandestine in a lot of his activities. But he has a, a lot of personality traits of a killer, of a killer. And believe it or not, even though at this point we don't, have definitive proof pro or con but it looks like this may have been his first murders and imagine a quadruple murder your first time out but there hasn't been enough investigation yet to say that uh he's not a serial murder but he has all kinds of traits of a serial killer look we know right now he took a souvenir didn't he he took yeah, the IDs. We, yeah, that's that's what we we believe that the the IDs belong to. Um, I think there was several of them, not sure the exact number, but several of them, and um, that's the kind of thing I remember read uh, looking on, uh, you know, reading about and seeing videos on the BTK killer. 
He would keep uh, driver's licenses, trinkets, a wristwatch, a necklace of all of his victims. And he'd have them in a box and he'd secrete it in his home. And every once in a while, he would go get that box and he would just walk away from the house, walk away from his family. And he would relive it by touching it and feeling it. It gave him a visceral sense of actually recreating and being there. So, yeah, that is isn't uh, that is very typical. He is um, he spends a lot of time. Uh, he gives a lot of thought. He tracks the people when he decides to attack, he attacks. And with all that effort, he wants something to remember it by. And so that is something that's very typical of this sort of behavior. Now, I believe he probably uh, did not is not a serial killer in Pennsylvania. He may have done some really weird things and some very strange predatory things. But I, I would believe that uh, the, uh, the the Idaho killing is the is his first actual killing. You know, I have to also mention at this point, um, on Monday night at 9 p.m., we have Dr. Joni Johnston, a forensic psychologist of the highest order, who's going to come on our show and she's going to talk about, you know, personality, uh, personalities of killers. She's studied a lot of serial killers. She's interviewed murderers in, in state prisons in California. She's a brilliant woman and she's going to be on at nine o'clock. So, how apropos and how what great timing yeah. that we have Dr. Joni Johnson set to come on here. But we're going to talk about a lot of these things. Now, there's, there's a theory, and I, I never heard it in my actual homicide career in the NYPD, but we've heard the term incel. And what that stands for is involuntarily celibate. So here's this 28-year-old man who wants a girlfriend, wants to have sex, and for some reason, it could be his awkwardness, could be his way around women. Uh, he's unable to achieve that. So he beco becomes what they call an incel, involuntary celibate. And he begins to hate women. And building up, this could have been what was building up to this quadruple murder. And I am in no way a behavioral analyst. I didn't attend Quantico. I have no skills in that thing. I just, I'm just a regular copper, you know. And right. um, but there are people that, in fact, Dr. Joni Johnson. And during this investigation, we watched numerous, I call them talking heads from the FBI, talk about this, talk about his killer personality, talk about incel, talk about who he targeted, why he targeted. And we're going to get deeper into that. Uh, Gail Salatori, thank you so much for the four ninety nine dollars Super Sticker. Thank you, Bill, for the great show today. Well, it's not over, but thank you for saying that. Uh, uh, so kind of you. Um, so, yeah, there's many, many sides to this case. And it's been analyzed forward and backward. But do we really know the answers? Now, uh, the Dateline NBC, Keith Morrison said, oh, we know the story as to why. So now, again, is there leaks out there that they've been told by the investigators, this is why it happened, this is who he targeted? Because right now, we don't know specifically who he targeted. But someone does know, according to, it seems like uh, NBC knows, Keith Morrison knows. So more information potentially this was on court TV. I want to play a little bit of this because they get into some of the things like the timeline, uh, his body language, his behavior, all of those things which are very, very important. Another mass shooting. Another mass shooting. Turned out it wasn't. There were four victims, but it wasn't a shooting. And, and the more we started to dig into the facts and get more information from Idaho... The first question I think I had and a lot of people had was, well, okay, it wasn't a mass shooting. How do four people get murdered? How did they not get out? How, how many people were responsible for this? How did it happen? And then when we learned a little bit more about the timing, it's the middle of the night, some of it started to make some sense that people are sleeping and, you know, someone can sneak, sneak in and it, it can happen. Then, when we thought again, four victims, why? 
Why this house? Why these four students? The probable cause affidavit in the case against the accused killer of four University of Idaho students pieces together the movements of the suspect vehicle and coordinating cell phone location data beginning in the early morning hours of November 13th. At 2.42 a.m., the affidavit alleges that Brian Koberger's phone places him likely at his apartment on the WSU campus where he was a Ph.D. student studying and teaching criminology. At 2.44 a.m., Koberger's vehicle and cell phone are on the move. Police say his white Hyundai Elantra is spotted on WSU surveillance cameras traveling north on Nevada Street at State. You know, Mike, I just want to make a quick point and then we'll get back to this because this is fascinating. If the press has a timeline this outstanding and this seemingly right on, what do the police have? Right. To me, watching this, it's like, whoa, this is like incredible. So, and we spoke about even that 3D uh, recreation of him going into the crime scene. Again, imagine what the police are going to have as a presentation for trial. Right, right. And all of this was gathered that you see the 3D presentation and the presentation we're watching right now was gathered mo a lot through just reading very carefully the uh, probable cause affidavit for the arrest warrant. And so it all comes down to just reading it, going over it numerous times. And this is what you draw from it. It's fabulous stuff. When I get really big one day, Mike, I'm going to have a staff that does that for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be on it. Medium way. According to the affidavit, it was here in this area of the WSU campus where surveillance video and Koberger's cell phone placed him here around 2.47 a.m. According to the affidavit, he spent several minutes in this area where he allegedly turned off his cell phone before heading out of town toward Boston. Mike, go ahead. Say what, turning off his cell phone is what? Well, to me, uh, I would say it's uh, consciousness of guilt. I knew you were going to use that gearism. I had, Thank you. <laughs> I had to employ you to pull it out of the pocket there. Who who turns off their cell phone while they're driving someplace? Mine's on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. So you're obviously thinking it's premeditated, mm -hmm. undoubtedly. That's my point. Let's go Idaho. <laughs> By 2.53 a.m., Koberger's white Hyundai Elantra is observed heading in the direction of Moscow, Idaho. At 3.26 a.m., the affidavit then places Koberger's vehicle, now in the town of Moscow, in this residential neighborhood on Indian Hills Drive. This happens to be a road directly overlooking the Moscow Police Department. The Elantra is picked up on surveillance video moving west past the 700 block of Indian Hills. At 3.28 a.m., video shows the vehicle on Steiner Avenue at Highway 95 as it made its way towards the King Road neighborhood where the victims lived. Then from 3.29 a.m. to 4.20 a.m., the suspect vehicle, the white Hyundai Elantra, is observed multiple times on video passing by 1122 King Road during the alleged time of the murders before being seen on video speeding away on Walenta Drive. The probable cause affidavit states that the car likely exited the neighborhood at Palouse River Drive and Conestoga Drive, a road that eventually leads to Pullman, Washington. About two hours after he allegedly turned off his cell phone, police say Koberger turned it back on here near Blaine, Idaho. It's about 10 to 15 minutes south of Moscow, a rural community off Highway 95, and it has its own cell tower. According to the affidavit, from 4.50 a.m. to 5.26 a.m., Koberger's phone movements show him allegedly moving south towards Genesee, Idaho, and west towards Uniontown, Washington. At some point during this trip back to Pullman, he got rid of that knife. Yes. Problem is, it's such a rural area. It could be under a little bit of mud. It could be in a culvert. Could be, it could have been in a garbage can that was picked up, you know, and tossed away within 48 hours. That's the tough part is it's all in a, all in a rural area that's desolate. That's tough. Mike, it could be in a lake. Where yeah. do people throw guns and knives in New York City? Right. They throw the, Hudson, right in the, the, Hudson, 
the Hudson River could be the greatest gun store on earth. You know, it's uh, <laughs> right. That's where all the guns f- go into. And uh, that's probably, you know, he very likely could have thrown into a river, into a lake. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then unless someone saw him doing that. Right. What's the chances of a finding that knife? Yeah. You you know, if there was any sort of uh, a lake that might have been uh, ha- had video surveillance, but maybe in the summertime. You know, there might be some sort of video surveillance where if for a parking lot of a lake, but something like this in November, November 13th, it's a Sunday. Nobody's at lakes. It's real desolate. The only thing you could hope for was that there would be some sort of um, video from a nearby store and, and get lucky. You'd have to get really super lucky. And absolutely so far, no dice. Koberger may have taken a well-known back road called Thorn Creek Road at this point in his route towards his apartment. These are all very isolated roads, but Thorn Creek Road is known to be even more desolate. Police allege Koberger eventually made his drive back into Pullman, Washington from the quiet road of Johnson, where his vehicle was picked up on this security camera, the first time a camera captured his Hyundai after the murders were committed. By 5.30 a.m., police tracked the movements of Koberger's cell phone and vehicle back to his apartment. All right, we're going to... Pretty amazing, right, Mike? Yeah. I mean, uh, look, again, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it a couple more times. Koberger is innocent to proven guilty. However, we're just reviewing some of the evidence against him, the evidence that resulted in the probable cause. So, you know, some of you folks that are saying, oh, he's being railroaded. (laughs) He's not being railroaded. You know, this is very, very powerful circumstantial evidence. And anyone that says he's being railroaded is just, uh, they're they're misinformed. Yeah. He's, um, he's got great, uh, rep legal representation. Uh, she, she's, uh, got death penalty case experience. Um, she's got a, a staff of people working. They've got investigators, attorneys. They're going over everything with a fine tooth comb. They're working as hard as they possibly can. He's got the best legal representation. And you you know, as you pointed out at the very beginning of this podcast, is that Bill Thompson is going to is going to cross every I dot cross every T dot every I and make sure that there is no possibility of doing anything that would be untoward and can have evidence thrown out or have grounds for an appeal. Absolutely not. You know, some you know, with these, with the high profile homicide cases, you know, you handle the defendant with kid gloves. You make sure that you dot every I cross every T and that, you know, they get treated with the absolute uh, due process that they are entitled to, because you don't ever want to have a case where you worked all those hours on those days, those months and have it overturned on a technicality. Absolutely. We have two um, experts here, one a, a, a private eye and a, a body language uh, expert and a former district attorney who also has her own podcast. Let's watch a little bit of this. News online and former private investigator Erica Morse is with us. And in Nashville, Tennessee, legal commentator, former Los Angeles deputy district attorney, podcaster and YouTube host of The Emily Show, Emily D. Baker is back with us as well. Great to see you both. Thank you for joining me. Um, let's start and go through this house. There's three floors. Let's start on the first floor, that bottom level. Let's take a look. Uh, we have two views here, the front view of the home and the side view of the home. That's this bottom, bottom level. Um, inside now, if we're going to take you inside that bottom level. You can see you've got the uh, front door. You've got one bedroom on one side, another bedroom on the other. The stairs, that go upstairs. Um Let me start, Erica Morse, Um, Bethany, one of the roommates who the defense wants to speak to and says may have exculpatory evidence is in one of these bedrooms. What are your thoughts about what, if anything, that happened there on that first floor? It's hard to tell, Vinny. This, This probable cause affidavit makes no sense in terms of why walk past that first floor up to that second floor. Uh, it just does I don't understand it. I, I, I would understand that the defense would have some questions about this because you would assume that everybody in that house 
would not have made it out alive. And so uh, my problem with in this affidavit is missing or skipping that bottom floor and going up to that second floor to begin this terror. Emily, there was also a DoorDash delivery that we've heard about. And I'm wondering, does the DoorDash go to that door? Um, what else is going on down there in that bottom level? What are your thoughts uh, about what's happening down there? And what, if anything, that the roommate Bethany may be able to add to this to tell the jury and let them... You know, Mike, I just, I'm going to let her give her statement. But one of the things I feel is that the prosecution, the police, the investigators, the crime scene detectives, the medical legal investigators, they know exactly what happened. And yes. they reconstructed the crime scene the way great crime scene detectives do by blood spatter, by areas of exit and entry. There should be, they should know where he came in and definitively. We're guessing right now because they didn't put it out there because they don't want all of this crazy conjecture. But that's one of the things in a homicide, areas of entry and exit. And crime scene detectives, through a lot of different techniques, are going to look for that. Potentially, he could have been caught on video walking into that house. There is video outside that caught his car. That's so right. they may know exactly what door he came in. And the other thing is, what was the it's so important to everyone it seems what was the order of the murders you know and i believe also the investigators the police know exactly who was targeted right i believe they know exactly that too so a lot of this we're hearing a lot of talking heads and we're hearing a lot of conjecture but i believe the pros who are the police and the district attorney and the two assistant attorney general district attorneys who are assisting on this case, the FBI, the Idaho State Police, they know what time it is. Go ahead, Mike. That's right. Yeah, the, uh, right here, the, the uh, private investigator, uh, she might not have had any real law enforcement experience, and so therefore having trouble understanding the uh, probable cause affidavit is surprising to me because this is what we, we do for many years, and this is what we've done for many years, and this is what we analyze. And so the fact that she had trouble understanding it um, is surprising to me. But I think it's because she doesn't have the training or the experience in, in crime scenes, it, it, you know, as investigator, uh, as a police officer, as a first responder. So I, I, it, that's why I think she's is having trouble with it, because other than that, it's to me and you, we could read this and Phil, we could all read the probable cause affidavit. And it seems pretty clear to us after you read it once or twice, or maybe two or three times, what's going on. Uh, the fact that she can't means I think she's just really inexperienced with this sort of thing. It's kind of a little bit outside of what she does. Mike, uh, a question from Heidi Cakes. Thank you for the $10 super sticker. Question for Professor Geary. Do professors have access to student addresses or did BK stalk the student and put a camera in her apartment? I'm working and listening. Thank you. Yeah, I know from like the colleges I've worked at, you'll have access to uh, a student's, you know, cell phone number uh, and their address, you know, because you might have to send a certified letter. You might, you know, that sort of thing. You just, it is, the college always, always has that, the bursar's office, the registrar's office. Um, and you, it's easy enough to get absolutely, you know, you just send a request into uh, the registrar. So yes, uh, professors do. And getting an address of a student really would, you know, the request by a professor really wouldn't raise any sort of eyebrows whatsoever. Um, it would just be, oh, okay, the professor just wants the, uh, the address of a student. And so it wouldn't be thought twice about. Um, so, you know, that fact that he actually asked for a, an address of a student to, or possibly he didn't ask for address, maybe he followed her from class afterwards one time and there's so many students as you know uh, coming through hallways going around campus in between classes that he wouldn't be noticed uh stalking someone so um so it could have been done two different ways absolutely very good answer you know i just want to also make a point when we talk about crime scene experts and crime scene detectives they're a whole different level than me and, and mike i'm not good at that i'm totally and i admit it 
I, when they explained to, I've been to you know thousand crime scenes, they explained to me what happened because I don't have the ability like they do to read the crime scene almost like a book. They're amazing. You know, you got guys like Ed Wallace mm -hmm. who go is the duty runs uh, uh, a, a co-host, and he, he's brilliant. And he could look at a crime scene and said, "This is what happened. This is this happened first. This happened second. This happened." He can tell you, and you're like, how do you know that? And he'll explain it to you forensically. He'll explain it to you scientifically. And you're like, wow, no wonder yeah. I don't do this. <laughs> I'm not that right. smart <laughs> to do it's that. It's a right? study. It's a discipline all in itself. 100%. Let's get back to hear the district attorney here uh, and her thoughts. No. What if anything she knows about what happened that night, that morning? I think they're going to be really interested in timeline of when DoorDash got there, which door DoorDash came to, and if DoorDash getting there woke up Bethany, when she was home, um, when she went to bed, and that kind of information, because we don't know if the house was entered on the bottom floor or entered up above on the second floor, which exits outside to that back hill. So we don't know where the house was entered, but they're absolutely going to know want to know what this roommate heard and when and kind of start to put together that timeline a little bit more with DoorDash getting there and that's going to all be tracked by the DoorDash app pretty closely. Yeah that is a significant part of the time because it's so close in time. Um, let's move up to that second floor so let's take a look at the exterior of the house the middle level the second level um, you look at it from where you, you know the reason this house is so confusing is that the back and the front are really at the same level. You know, when you look at it, what, what, right. which is the first floor? You know, the way this right. building is constructed, it's very, very confusing. You know, this is like a, a, a construction worker's nightmare, this house. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know who designed this place, but it's really like, what the heck? What was this guy thinking? You know, it was totally just put together to maximize the total, the, uh, um, the most bedrooms you could put yeah. in a structure, because obviously who, the person who owned it was renting it to students. Oh, mm -hmm. there's six bedrooms, whatever there is, right? And right. that's what the person was interested. And look, my sons went to college, and the, the first house that my son rented at his college after he got out of the dorms, I, I threatened the owner. It was it was like the place should have been condemned by every agency in the state, you know? The Department of Buildings, Department of Santa. It was filthy. It was disgusting. And I was like, dude, are you kidding me? And he was like, oh, the students do this. The students do you know, you Tell that to someone that's going to listen. You know, <laughs> so th this this house, again, it's it, it's, it's it doesn't mess. look well. Yeah, it's a mess. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. I mean, it's yeah. it's really crazy where the cars park, it is the second level. You need to go up the stairs if you enter through the door with the wreath in, in that basement. But uh, as Emily pointed out, if you climb up the hill on the side of the road, there's a sliding door entrance or exit that goes into the kitchen. Now, let's take a look at the, the floor plans of this main floor. There's, you, you see where the patio is on the top right-hand side. You see where the kitchen is. That's, you know, sliding door through the kitchen. And then on one side, you have Dylan. And then on the other side, you have Ethan and Zana. And Dylan, we know, um, Erica, is someone who apparently saw or allegedly saw the killer from her doorway. Um, significant. You know, Mike, I think getting back, everyone is very concerned with this DoorDash delivery. Mm -hmm. And I think the only one that benefits is the defense. Yes. Because it allows them to create doubt. How do we know the door? I think they spoke, the police spoke to the DoorDash person. So I don't know how much mileage the defense can get out of that. But it, it does create a little bit of doubt, I think. Yeah, I, I agree because the DoorDash person, I think he, at 4.02 or something like that, it was like right after 4 a.m., the uh, the timeline is so brief that I, I think that throws a lot of people off because they're like, oh, it, it can't possibly be Koberger or it can't possibly be just one person because you're, de you're dealing with violent physical 
uh, confrontations, four of them all happening with a knife, all happening in the space of, you know, something like four minutes. Or, and the, so the DoorDash guy, you know, ha, is a bookend, is a start. It's got to be somewhere after 403, and it has to be done by like 420. And uh, so it helps the defense. Absolutely. You're right. Absolutely. Folks, this is um, this is police off the cuff, real crime stories. If you like tr real crime, true crime from a police perspective, you're in the right place. We simply go with facts. We present the evidence. And I'll say again, Brian Koberger is innocent to proven guilty. People get down on me. They say, I don't say it enough. I'm too pro-prosecution. I'm presenting the evidence as I see it. Not even as I see it. I'm presenting the evidence factually, what the evidence is and what the evidence tells us. Anyway, if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and ring that bell. If you really like this show, you want to support us financially, go on our Patreon. We have three different levels. Uh, you can you can join our Patreon, or if you want to become a part of our YouTube family, you see the folks in the green font. We have five different levels on our YouTube family, and we'd appreciate all the support we could get. But uh, we're growing, and with your help, we'll grow even further. You know, Mike, a lot of what people are talking about now, and you wouldn't think it was that important, but it gives a face and it gives a voice to Brian Koberger. And I, what I'm referring to is the car stop mm -hmm. one month prior uh, to the murders. And we also, of course, we see the car stop later on by the Indiana State Police. But a lot of people, look, I, I, I'm a big believer in body language, I think, you know, there's there's all those things, how to read a person like a book. And sure. supposedly 90% of a message is conveyed by physical attributes. So look, I'm, I'm getting Italian all of a sudden, and I'm not Italian. <laughs> I'm speaking with my hands. Well, it's Philly when you need them. Anyway, so yeah, 90% of a, you can believe it, not believe it, of a, of a message is conveyed by body language. And I've seen it millions of times in my career. Someone could tell you something and say the exact opposite with their body language, you know? Uh, so it is important to read. But having said that, I don't definitively think you can always lock in and say, oh, arms like this means you're being defensive. Yeah, most of the time it does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And certain, you know, you'll hear body language experts define certain things as deception that's deception yeah on the most part but i think it always has to be taken in the context that the body language is used right and people speak very differently culturally you know um you know so we don't all speak the same but you, you know all those little movements you're raising your eyebrows the tone of your voice the way you say something quickly slowly closing your hands uh my father used to always, we'd talk like this all the time. It, it was just a habit. Uh, or you cross your legs. Is that defensive? I, I don't think so. You know, it's the whole package. It's the context in which it occurs. You're absolutely right. It's not just, oh, everyone who looks away is um, being being uh, deceptive. No, sometimes I do it all the time. I, I look up at this. I look up at the top of the ceiling, you know, of the, of the classroom. I'm doing. I'm just showing you right now, like this, when I'm thinking of something. Because well, because Mike, you're, you're such you're such a deep, deep thinker. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if my students would agree with you, but you know, it, it gives you a, a quick pause, you know, to to think. So it's all these mannerisms. So yeah, they're very, very accurate, and there is that commonality across cultures about how people express joy, happiness, sorrow, things like that. But, you know, it, you have to take it within, with a grain of salt, but take it also within the context in which it occurs. Uh, someone could be seem very gregarious and put their arm around you, but they might be uh, really um, trying to avoid you, trying, just trying to get rid of you, you know. So cops are good with it. We're very good with body language because we see it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But... Um, books are good to give you good indications, but you get your real training by re reading people, by really doing it over and over and over again as a cop. Absolutely. I'm going to go to a little bit of um, Brian Koberger's car stop. It gives us a chance, and I know you guys, most people have seen this a thousand times, but it gets you to see a little bit of who he is. Who Who is the person 
behind this car stop here. And uh, we'll watch a little bit of this. Hello, I am Officer Langus. Stop spinning audio and video recorded. I think, I, know, I think you know why I stopped you. You ran the red light. What actually happened was I was stuck in the middle of the intersection. Yeah, so I, was I was behind you the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. So technically, you're not supposed to enter the intersection at all for that reason. Because if the light turns red, then you're stuck in the intersection. And then you're on the red light. So that's the reason I stopped you. Do you have your license on you? Yep. It's really quite amazing how much interaction with police uh, the accused killer in the uh, Idaho student's case had. That was some video about a month before the murders. And what I want to do is take a look at his interaction with police before the murders and after the murders with our guest joining me in Los Angeles, California, a forensic psychiatrist. No, 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 no. Joining us in Alexandria, Virginia, body language expert, New York Times bestselling author of You Can't Lie to Me. That is Janine Driver. Janine, great to see Hi, you. Hi. Nice to see you, Vinny. All right. So we're going to do the before. We've got a couple of clips before, then one clip after. This, again, is the accused killer. And, again, one of the stories that and, and prosecutors are saying, he, he was in the area many times sort of inferring that they believe he was, you know, planning this thing out a little bit. So let's take a look first. This is a... And, Mike, we call that being in the area, we call that a recon. You're right. And right. it's short, short, of course, for reconnaissance. And the police do it, but so do perps, you know? Absolutely. If we were going to do a warrant, we would do a recon to see what we were dealing with. And uh, hopefully you would do a good enough recon that you would hit the correct place. That's right. And perps do it too. So you want to get the, the hell out of there as soon as possible. Uh, police. So can you, would you explain that to me a little bit further? So in Pennsylvania, when you're mm -hmm. stuck like in their intersection, mm -hmm. you have to make the left. So what would what would the appropriate thing for me to have done? Not, just, just you're not, not supposed to situation? block an intersection like that in Washington. So the just by you blocking the intersection, that's technically a ticketable. You know, I, I can't believe how many people objected to this, that that wasn't fair, that he could have got, a, you know, in New York City, not only would you get a red light summons, but it's a two points, I think, against your license. And I think the summons is like 250 bucks. For, and they call it blocking the box. Right. And right. what it simply means, if the traffic doesn't, it just moves past the intersection and then stops, you're not supposed to go into the intersection because if you do and the light turns red, you're going to be stuck there and blocking the traffic going the other way. So it's taking very seriously in New York City. Oh, so yeah. I, I can't believe how many people were like, no, it's not fair. I was like, well, maybe not in Idaho, but New York City, you're getting a nice two points on your license. And a $250 summons. Violation. And then thus, then you're running a red light. So it's another ticketable offense. So you're not supposed to proceed into the intersection until you can go. Because a lot of people do what you just did, right? Is like you're sitting in the intersection waiting and then turns and then you're blocking. So Yeah, there was a little <laughs> bit of confusion with speeding because someone had stopped. I wasn't sure what they were doing. And then they put on their light to turn. Mm -hmm. So I thought that maybe they were letting me go through. Oh. Did you see that? No. Mm -mm. I feel like right before I made the turn, there was someone who yeah, so like, made a right. Yeah. They didn't have their, you know, their signal on. So I wasn't sure if they were just waiting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would just advise, yeah. uh, just don't enter the intersection until you can go. So you don't get stuck. Um, let's see. You know, I think he knows the answers to the questions that he's asking. And he's just asking them almost to sort of like play the cop, you know, your thoughts, Mike. Yeah. He, you know, he's from Pennsylvania. And so maybe they do things slightly different in Pennsylvania. Maybe he's from a really rural area, Pennsylvania, and this might be a built up area around, around the actual uh, university itself. But um, he's, he's probably comes across uh very, very compliant. Um, and he's want, he doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to get, doesn't want to get a ticket. This is a, a month before the, the, the homicide took place. And, uh, I think he's just trying to stay off the radar, trying to, uh, have some conversation and, uh, be as compliant as he possibly can have her explain the law. Um, you know, not be confrontational, let her be in charge. Um, and, um, I, I think he's does, he's, 
already at this point within a month, he's probably already planning to do something. So um, this is a smart move on his point. Just play the cop a little bit, just back away. Don't sit there and, you know, point out this and that. And he just asked her one question about, did you see the other person? And that was about it. But uh, very you know, Mike, when, when you think, when you think of this and you think of what happened a month later, mm -hmm. had he gotten a summons, that would have been a huge investigative resource Yes, for this investigation. Mm -hmm. They would have found that white Hyundai like, boom, you know, faster than they even found it because That's they right. would have, they would have run the summons database and they were, and I'm not saying I'm not faulting this cop that she has discretion on whether to the, give the summons or not, but just for our listeners, had they given him a summons that would have provided the police another avenue of finding out who, who owned this, this white Hyundai. Right. Remember back uh, years ago, the son of Sam case, the 44 caliber killer in New York, he was caught in part or uh, mainly to a parking ticket. He got when he left 100%. his car parked in front of a fire hydrant to go kill some people. And he came back That's and there right. was a ticket on it. And they, they promoted the cop that wrote the summons to detective. Yeah. Right? Good Which is not, <laughs> not, not bad. But in that situation, the best thing to do then would be back up. Not... I don't know if there's a best it's thing like... to do in that situation because you're either going to back up into somebody yeah. or you're going to run a red light. So, or you're going to be sitting in an intersection. Yeah. There's not really a great option there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was just slightly into the crosswalk, so... Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, we're on, I'm from Pennsylvania. We actually don't have like crosswalks. Oh, so even if you're if you're kind of slight, I I almost, I almost feel like saying, "Hey, dude, this isn't Pennsylvania. This is Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> Just shut up about Pennsylvania." <laughs> but she can't. She's on body worn video. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a little bit more leeway as well. Like there are a few lines. Like there's one white line, and there's another one. Mm -hmm. like, there's like a like a certain yeah. margin from which you can actually. Kind of put your vehicle, uh, place your vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So I know laws vary state to state, but there is a law yeah. in Washington for blocking an intersection like that, proceeding through when it, you don't, um, when you're just stalling. Here. Let's see what the now, body the language person, says. You might see this and say, hey, this is normal. This is how I would respond, possibly trying to build rapport to get out of a ticket and ask a lot of questions. There's a couple things here that we see in this clip, and I think we're going to carry one of them over to the next clip. One is a tongue protrusion, and I think we'll talk about it again in the next clip. He stuck his tongue out briefly. We'll, we'll talk about that. Just hang tight. But before that, when he talks about someone had stopped in front of him, he does this little micro expression, Vinny and you at home, where his upper lip comes up, and he, all, he flashes his teeth. And this is something we saw Cato Kalin do on the stand, going back old school here with O.J. Simpson, uh, when Marsha Clark was asking questions, hey, isn't it true that you've got this book deal or this some type of a deal, you're making money out of this case? And he does this snarl. When the upper lip comes up and we see the teeth like this, this is a combination between anger and disgust and that equals scorn. So, and we have this tiny little sneak peek of scorn, which is very intriguing to what's to come a month later. The other thing I'd like to talk about here is his eyes open wide. Look right here. You're seeing the three whites, we call it in law enforcement, the inner part of the eye, the outer part, and underneath. If we look at Vinny's eyes right now, mine, you'll notice you don't see three whites of our eyes. This happens right here when we're under stress. You were just pulled over for a ticket. Make, make sense, right? Fear or surprise. It usually indicates something is wrong. Again, pulled over for a ticket, probably scouting out the area here on the college campus. O.J. Simpson, going back to him, he did this in the civil case when he was shown a picture of himself wearing Bruno Megley's shoes walking on a football field, when in the criminal case, he said he never owned those ugly shoes. Yet they, all of a sudden, show, according to him, he called them ugly, and with a swear word that I won't say here. And all of a sudden... You know, Mike, this is great stuff, This uh, the body language. Uh, and of course, she's an expert. And I'd just like to, to say that I had some detectives who were in homicide, and they were known to everyone that were the greatest interviewers. And they were the go-to guys when you had the baddest guy on earth and you wanted to put your top interviewers in there. Because all detectives aren't the same. Some are good at other things. Some are good at, uh, you know, interview and interrogation so reading body language yes is so so important and it's part of the investigation and you know something 
even not in police work, reading body language in sales, if you're a sales rep, whatever your field is, it's a good thing to know. Being a professor, reading the body language of your students, mm -hmm. they know when Professor Geary looks up, uh, looks up at the <laughs> ceiling, he's in deep thought, right. you know. But what about their language? What are they showing to you? And all of this stuff is very important, and it is fascinating. Right. It's how we communicate besides just the uh, voice and the uh, spoken language. And it tells you a lot about how someone's feeling because someone could say, um, yeah, no, you know, things like that. And that, and they might do it involuntarily because, yeah. And I, I think with the eyes and the, with the lip, I didn't catch those things. And um, I thought that we saw the eyes look up because he was lower than she was. She was like leaning over the window of the car. So I didn't really see that. But, um, you know, there's all those little tidbits that uh, the, the uh, body gives away that even the person who's speaking um, may not be aware of. Um, and so it's a good thing to learn. And you pick up an awful lot of this sort of information, maybe not to that absolute degree, but you pick it up uh, as a police officer. And when you're a detective interviewing someone, you know, you got to be able to, I, I had some of my partners, I mean, they could uh, sell sand to Saudi Arabians. They were so good. They could, uh, they were just amazing uh, being able to just chat, make, you know, say something, get somebody to, to go in a specific way to move or to think about something. And that's a real great gift. And to be able to interpret body language like that. Absolutely. Son, the civil case, they're showing him a picture. You see OJ, look at the picture and look up and you see those three whites. This is, uh-oh, something is wrong. I just got busted. Again, it could make sense for the ticket, but it hangs out. Look at this. This is hanging out the entire conversation, the three whites. He knows there's a problem here and trying to build that rapport to get out of it. Okay, Janine, what we're going to do now, this is more, that was more of the video. Uh, we're going to go to the after one now. We're going to show, they're going to show right now the car stop from the Indiana State Police. And, you know, just to go back to a certain uh, journalist who's writing a book on the Idaho murders. And he just talked about how cool, calm, and collected Koberger was. And I had to be looking at a different Koberger because to me, in this picture, he looks like a deer on the first day of hunting season. And I've said it before. But uh, I don't know what this author was thinking of. But anyway, we'll, let's not beat him up. Now, this is a video of a traffic stop after the murders. And interested to see if you notice any difference in the way he is um, in what you see and what you hear. So let's watch. Hello. How you doing? How y'all doing today? Good, good. Take a look at your driver's license real quick if I could. See, he's right up on that van, man. He was right up on the back end of that van. Old driver for tailgating. Is this your car? Okay. Cool. Where are you headed? You know, there was another video. I, uh, I don't know if it was this car stop. You could see, a, a visually see a cut on his right wrist. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't, I don't see it in this, but... There's a been a lot of uh, conjecture on this. I have no doubt the FBI asked the Idaho State, excuse me, the Indiana State Police to pull him over. I do not believe for one second that they pulled him over twice. Uh, I, and I don't know why the FBI just is, doesn't admit it, that they asked him to pull it over, because it, it makes no sense. that It makes sense that you pulled him over. Yeah, let's see what's in the car. Let's see what his hands look like. Let's see how he acts, mm -hmm. you know? Makes exactly. Perfect, perfect There's nothing sense. to hide. There's nothing to right. hide whatsoever. It's perfectly fine if he's if the police officer sees uh, and uh, you know objectively sees a uh, traffic infraction, driving infraction, he has the ability to do that. There's absolutely nothing wrong, nothing nefarious whatsoever. Exactly. Yeah. Let's play a little more. Well, we coming from WSU. You know, that I don't get either. We're going for some Thai food. What does that have to do with the price of tea in China? You know what I mean? You're being pulled over. Who cares where you're going to get Thai food? You're in the state of Indiana. Who gives a shit where you're going to dinner? You know, like that is, of course, nervousness. Yeah. You know, 
You think the trooper cares that they're going to? Oh, you don't know Indiana, but you know where a, a Thai food restaurant is. Right, right. By it's the like, way, by the way, I know on Highway 47 there's a Thai food restaurant. You know, so it just doesn't make much <laughs> sense to me. And, uh, what's WSU? So we're okay. I, I'm having a hard time hearing it because of the traffic. So you're coming from Washington State University, and you're going where? Oh, oh okay. Yeah, we we <laughs> we drove from <laughs> Idaho to Indiana to get some Thai food. I would have been like, dude, what are you talking about? You know. Where where is your destination? Your final destination? One eight hundred Thai food. Come on. That's funny. Yeah, we're a little we're slightly much because we drive for hours, hours, days. To drive. Well, almost a day. Okay. And what did you say about some SWAT team thing? Or yeah, there was yeah there was the man shooting and everything. We don't where? where? This was all the you know folks i just wanted to say you know as what we spoke about earlier that you know there was a journalist that wrote how cool calm and collect to me again you know all i i just don't see the sight you know going for the deer because he is really super super nervous and it's written all over his face. It's written in the answers he gives to the state trooper. And there's nothing cool, calm, and collected. It almost seems to me like his father knows what happened it, by his behavior, too. I don't, I'm not saying he did, but it seems that way. By his, his behavior was also a little suspect, in my opinion. Yeah, I think ner being nervous, sometimes some, it's very common for people to talk a lot. And, you know, make small talk just to fill in the time. And I think that's what Koberg is doing. He's saying all kinds of little things that, you know, about the Thai food and stuff like that. I think um, the idea that he's talking about the, uh, the shooting at Washington State um, is also trying to explain why he's driving, you know, from Washington to Pennsylvania. Why don't you just say you're driving? It's the end of the semester. You're a student there and you're going from there to your home. Um, his dad, uh, I'm not so sure of, um, uh, he just seems kind of like he's exhausted, but uh, Koberger, obviously he's very nervous and he's making all kinds of small talk. A lot of small talk. Interesting. Well, it's horrifying. He's just going to the university. You know I mean? mm -hmm. So, so y'all work at the university there? Or? I actually do work there. Oh. Do Okay. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't heard about that incident just yesterday or oh, well, let's we make sure to... we get it in because I have to get the gap, as you know. The producers usually tell me to wrap it up. Uh, basically, these LY words, be very careful of those. Basically, we don't give raises the first year. That indicates sometimes you make an exemption and you do give raises. I want to be the exception. I call these the wiggle words, usually, typically, normally. And he says, basically, this is what we did. That indicates to me this L-Y particular here, this adverb, that there's something else he was doing. He uses the word actually three times. Actually, Vinny compares two different things. Let me do a quick test with you, Vinny. Um, did you buy the red car or the blue truck? Actually, I bought the red car. What am I? What are the, the other thing I'm comparing it to? Did the you blue, buy the red car or the blue, blue truck? Blue car. There's two choices. Right. So, right. So, base this actually, I mean, is comparing two things. You buy the red car, the blue truck. I bought the red car. Actually, I bought the red car as opposed to the blue truck. When people throw in this actually where it doesn't belong, it's indicating he was really someplace else. Actually, what we were just doing was this. No, that's not what you were doing because we don't know. He's comparing it to something we don't know. If I was in law enforcement, Phil, I would teach this officer to ask as opposed to what? because he threw in that actually. Not only did he do it once, Vinny, and you at home, he said it three times. Normally, we can think there's an L-Y there. Normally, we can figure out what it is. Did you have fun at the party? Actually, I had a good time. Maybe they thought they weren't going to have a good time. 
But here, this is very suspicious. Now let's talk about body language. He's not breathing. Look at him. He, it's as if no air is coming into him. I'm even watching his throat. And this happens a lot with deception and high stress. People forget to breathe. We do see the three whites of the eyes right here. And he does this move that I did see earlier and didn't get to talk about, which is this tongue protrusion. This tongue out, this jutting of the tongue. This is someone's got caught and they made a mistake or getting away with something or deep concentration. If you've ever threaded a needle, imagine threading a needle. You've got the eye of the needle in front of you. You've got the thread. You stick out your tongue. So we've got this deep concentration or he thinks he's getting away with something or he just got caught. A lot happening right here. The I never do that because I never thread a needle. So you've uh, never threaded a needle? <laughs> no, I have. I have, but not in a long time. In fact, he's not even breathing and he's so stiff. Now looking away, I throw that away because he's on a busy road here. The everyday person is going to look to make sure that they're safe. So that behavior I'm gonna ignore, but this lack of breathing, the wrinkled in the forehead right here is high stress. We didn't even see it in the first time, but we're seeing it here. And then of course, this tongue protrusion. And the big one for me, the smoking gun is the word actually. I wrote it down and did my little three tick marks. This is huge. And these LY words, if you go back to Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, she loved the LY word. Right. So. so that was actually interesting, you know, but I found uh, it actually interesting. yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, when you look at his behavior being pulled on, I think the state trooper's job wasn't to ask difficult questions. It was basically just to observe and ask somewhat innocuous questions because the whole thing's being recorded on his body worn video. So he doesn't have to ask difficult, difficult questions. You know, Mike, we, we're already at an hour and 11 minutes, and we didn't really even get to, you know, his, his behavioral analysis part of it. So I don't think we're going to get to that tonight because uh, I don't think our fans want to stay overnight listening to us. But I think it's fascinating. And just so folks know, we have um, Dr. Judy Johnston, a brilliant, brilliant behavioral analyst, forensic psychologist coming on Monday evening at 9 o'clock. And I was on a show once of duty runs with her, and a lot of the audience got mad at me because I challenged her on a few things, and they were like, she'll never talk to you again. She contacted me and asked if she could come on the show. So you guys were wrong. <laughs> she loves police off the cuff, real crime stuff. Anyway, so Dr. Judy Johnston, Monday night at 9 p.m., we'll get a little bit deeper into the behavioral analysis. And this whole... And I don't know specifically, because I look, again, I never went to Quantico. I'm not a behavioral analyst. However, this whole incel thing is a possibility. I think it's there is a possibility that he was an incel or is an incel. Your thoughts, Mike? Yeah, I think he it has had so many occasions from the time he was a teenager to, to you know, to the time of the homicides where he was awkward. He was overweight. He was rejected by by girls, and um, it built up a lot of resentment and rage. He didn't go after the particular girls who actually, you know, rebuffed him, but he killed, uh, you know, uh, girls or and targeted. Like we know about the girl in Washington, um, the student who were representative of a group that actually had rejected him, and. Um, that is, it's like a symbolic killing. And, um, that I think that's what that was. He picked, he picked out a victim who was a, a female, uh, and he wanted to kill a female and that would make him feel better about the, uh, to get, getting over the rejection that may, he may have felt over the years and this forced celibacy that he has. He doesn't have a girlfriend, you know, any sort of like that intimate male, female personal relationship. And uh, I think this was his response to it. You know, the obvious thing, too, is his behavior at Washington State University as a teaching assistant caused him to get fired. Mm -hmm. uh, firing a Ph.D. candidate is not done lightly. It's not an easy thing. The faculty would have to give that a lot of thought. There's a lot of probably politics within who gets accepted. Mm -hmm. into a PhD program, a doctorate program, and to, to sort of admit that the university, we made a big mistake in this guy. This guy is not who we thought he was, was or is or was going to be. We got to get rid of this guy. He's dangerous. 
and they fired him. And uh, that was that was after the murders, of course. But they didn't know that. No. So it was his behavior as a teaching assistant that got him fired. So you know, when we talk to Dr. Joni Johnston, we're going to talk about some of these things, some of his behavior, where he grew up. What was his behavior like growing up? We know, oh, he was fat at one time. Allegedly, he was a heroin addict at one time. Um, he didn't seem like a very, he was a socially awkward guy. I'll put it that way. All right. But there's lots of socially awkward people in this world that don't murder four people. That's right. And he had a, 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 a very, very uh, right below the surface, an aggressive streak. We saw that. Uh, in the uh, timeline from the time he got there and began teaching in the very, very late August, right, right before the, um, the Labor Day holiday. And within four weeks, uh, he was having problems with the students. They were complaining about him. Uh, he was dismissive of them. Didn't appear to be very interested in what they had to say, their theories about criminology. Um, he then also had some issues and confrontations with his faculty mentor. Now, firing somebody like they did to him isn't taken lightly. The, you know, they have a lot invested in him. He's got one-on-one -on -one mentoring with the faculty advisor. They're giving him classes to teach. So he's actually representing as a teaching assistant uh, the college to those students. And so hopefully that they uh, he's a good uh, teacher and he could, you know, give them some good uh, some a decent education where they're excited about criminology and criminal justice. Um, they've got, he's got an apartment, you know, he's probably got a meal plan. You know, they have a lot invested and for them to decide to get rid of him somewhere in probably very early December, mid-December, mid I think it was, um, says a lot about how sure they were that they had made a mistake He's not going to be successful. He's got the he's got the IQ, but he doesn't have the emotional uh, intelligence to get along with people. And they saw that, and um, they did the right thing. Uh, unfortunately, it came after he the, the homicides because if it had happened earlier, then you might not have had these homicides. He might have had to leave, and it never the timeline would have never occurred like it did. But they saw something in him where they realized we've got the wrong guy representing our college. You know, Mike, you brought up a good point. I used to say this to my students. I used to say it to my detectives. I, you know what the most important thing is about you? It's the check mark you got on your report card in second grade that says gets along well with others. Because if you didn't pass that, you're never going to do well in life. And that happens to be true. And whether it's being a police detective, a college student, if you can't get along well with others, again, I always laugh because second grade, yeah. yeah. Imagine you got that and you came home, your parents would be like, what is this? You don't get along well with others? Right. And it's so true, even though it's so simple, but it says so much. Right. If you can't get along with others, it, you're going to have a very lonely life. And you're, gonna, you're not going to enjoy the, you know, the successes in your chosen profession. You're going to be very lonely. You're not going to have a lot of friends. You're going to feel marginalized. You're going to you're going to feel a little bit angry and vindictive towards people. And so you end up, you know, in that sort of situation where you're living a very uh, unfulfilling life. And um, sadly, also for Kohlberger, just thinking about it, as we're talking right now, is that his chances of getting into a Ph.D. program in the future, like, say, at University of Pennsylvania or something like that, after he was dismissed from the University of Washington, is really slim because uh, they're going to take to heart what the, the professors at Washington State said. And so, and that's really sad because uh, not being able to get along with others, you know, those kind of people, they lead sad, very lo sad, lonely lives. And they often, with their aggression, shoot themselves in the foot because their anger and their resentment towards people it just bubbles up occasionally at certain times, at certain places, under certain circumstances, with a little bit of stress, they suddenly, there'll be an outburst. And we know he had those kind of outbursts with uh, his students and with his faculty advisor. He couldn't keep it under wraps, no matter how much he could smile, no matter how bright he was about, and he could reel off you know, criminal theories. 
He just couldn't keep that part under wraps because that was actually a part of his his DNA, who he was. Absolutely. You know, at this point, I just want to also mention who, in the final analysis, this is who this is about. And these are the four victims, Ethan Chapin, Zaina Canodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves. And I think that sometimes we lose sight. This gets to be, you know, everyone, oh, this is so interesting. This is this and this is that. But that's who this case is about. And just a quick recap, some of the new things we found, of course, we all know if you haven't been following this case, he has been indicted by a grand jury, which means there is no hearing starting on June 26. However, there is an arraignment this Monday uh, at 0900, and that's Pacific time. So I guess it would be 12 noon uh, East Coast time. And he's going to be arraigned. At that arraignment, he will plead guilty or not guilty. Uh, pleading not guilty, what will occur then is the, the judge will choose a date to start the trial. Uh, as we've predicted here, it's probably not going to happen till September, or it could even happen in 2024. We don't know. The wheels of justice, as we say, move very slowly. Uh, you know, Mike, just a, 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 an a off-the-wall thing. Is there any possibility that he could be bailed? No, 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 I, I don't see that. Um, no, no, no. Mike, I, I, I just had to ask it. I don't believe yeah, there was yeah. any, there's any chance either, but uh, yeah. I think it has to be answered in New York. They probably would have let him out already, you know. Uh, <laughs> He'd have been given a desk appearance. <laughs> He'd have taken two or three more collars and, and they'd have to bring him back in. Yeah. Uh, so, folks, again, we, we, we the other thing was if you're tuning in late, on uh, last night on Dateline, they revealed the fact that there is evidence that Brian Kohlberger bought a K-Bar knife off of Amazon. You know, something powerful, powerful evidence. Whoever you naysayers that say he's not the right guy or he's he's getting his rights are getting violated. No, that's not happening. And I just also know if they have this type of evidence. I believe there's tons more evidence in this case that we don't know about. They re they released that on uh, Dateline NBC, and we we've said from the very beginning, and I'm, I'm not blowing our own horn, but his blood is in that crime scene. There's a 99% chance his blood is in that crime scene. Iron Range Rube, thank you for the $10 super sticker. I love this channel, but Bill comes across as very arrogant. I, I don't know if I should have read that, but thank you. You know something? <laughs> you got to be arrogant to be a cop. You know, uh, or you have to be. Let me put it this way: you have to be confident. I don't think I'm arrogant. You have to be confident. You know something? You don't walk into the apartments of murderers and and not have a certain confidence. You could call it arrogance. You could call it whatever you want. Anyway, Mike, your final thoughts. Uh, final thoughts. You know this. This is the great developments uh, in this, in this case, uh, and have patience because. Uh, you're going to need it. It's going to be a while before this comes to fruition. He's going to 99.999% chance come Monday. He'll just, uh, you know, plead guilt, uh, plead not guilty. And they'll set a date. And that date will be six months from now. And then hopefully it'll all be settled in early in 2024, whether he uh, changes his plea to guilty or whether they go through with the trial. But the watchword right now is just patience. Yeah, I think I really do think you need patience. And, you know, I as much as I liked the fact that uh, Dateline NBC came up with the, the fact that he bought this cable knife off of Amazon, I couldn't help but feel a little bit slighted that either they got that information delivered to them by someone inside the investigation or their own investigators went to Amazon and we got that information. And I don't think Amazon's required to keep it quiet because obviously the information was released. but. Very, very, very powerful evidence. And again, we'll say circumstantial evidence. Exactly. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, I sort of had to come on because I thought it was important with some of the new information, the grand jury indictment, which we did already cover. Of course, the, um, the knife that was purchased on Amazon. We know the sheath was left behind. 
And just, you know, now I think more than ever, they're going to be looking into his uh, behavioral analysis. And that's going to come to the forefront also. I, Mike, a couple more words and we got to go. We're, uh, we're running over time here. Oh, no. I think this is great. Um, this is the type of stuff that uh, people should know about because this way it, it kind of puts to, to, to rest as much as possible conspiracy theories about the police officers, you know, framing Brian Koberger or anything like that. So this, this is great stuff. Absolutely. Um, Lucas Fisher, thank you for the 499 super stick. You have earned the right of arrogance. <laughs> I, you know, something I'm not, I'm not accepting that title. I, I think it's, it's not arrogance. I, I think it's confidence, you know, something, and you know, something, if I didn't, Look, there's a certain swagger you have as a New York City cop. You can call it arrogance. You could call it overconfidence. You could call it whatever you want. But as I said, you know, some you're facing people with guns and knives and going into places that are dark with dangerous people in it. So if you don't have a certain amount of arrogance from doing that, I'll take that as a badge of honor. Thank you very much. The person that said it, I'll pull you up. I'll put it up again. Uh, Iron Range Rube. Uh, thank you for... Uh, for calling me out for my arrogance. And thank you for the $10 super sticker. Very much appreciated. I'll take that as a badge of honor. Guys, have a great night. Thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be still, of course, following this case because it's fascinating. And we uh, appreciate your support. Have a great night. Good night. One episode.